very kind welcome and thank you very much for inviting me to talk here today. Um, I had prepared a, uh, a presentation and in the light of what I've heard I've, I've modified it somewhat because <laughs> I realise, I, I, I knew really that, I, um, that this would be the case, but I am I think I can, I can assume I'm preaching here to the converted about the BBC. So I'm not going to be making any arguments um, based on um, the, um, try, trying to look at the, the reasons why the BBC is like it is. But um, just first of all, a little bit more about me and, and more about Newswatch, which I um, uh, founded in 1999, so I've been on this beat now for um, 17 years, amazingly. Um, as, um, as you've heard, I, I did work for the BBC, and before that I worked for, uh, I, I did the traditional route into journalism, which was weekly newspapers and then evening newspapers, and I joined the BBC in 19, as long ago as 1978, when I became a producer on BBC Radio Cleveland up here on Teesside and I then uh, moved to the BBC in London as a uh, reporter in the what was that called the the pool and I worked uh, for a variety of programs including including World at One uh, the Today program and, and various various others like analysis um, and then I moved into PR for the BBC and that gave me a very interesting insight as to how the BBC worked because it kind of catapulted me to the top level of the management of um, the BBC. I was PR for the News and Current Affairs programmes, so programmes like Panorama um, and uh, all the news programmes, uh, Newsnight of course, the ones you're all familiar with. And uh, I, I, I attended as part of that the weekly management meetings. I knew exactly what was going on in Lime Grove. I knew, which was then the headquarters of BBC News and Current Affairs. And I got to see how the, the top people in the BBC thought. Now in those days, I was a lefty too. <laughs> and so um, I, I've had a remarkable transformation since then. And looking back, one of the first programmes I dealt with, um, and looking round, I'm sure some of you remember it, was Maggie's Militant Tendency, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. which um, came out um, in, from memory, I think it was about... I, 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 no, it was earlier. I, I, I'd left the BBC by 86. It, it must have been 1984. And quite clearly, with the benefit of hindsight, the Lime Grove editors had been looking to do that programme for years. They were trying to nail Maggie, they were trying to nail the Conservative Party, and they put such effort into that that they saw it as their flagship. They wanted to do programmes like that. Um, and I think that says a lot about the BBC. Um, you, we, we've had at the heart of the BBC since Certainly, when I joined the BBC, from when I joined the BBC, I think earlier, it's hard to trace it exactly, we've had a, a very strong bias against the Conservative Party and against anything to do with British traditions. Um, anyway, after uh, working at the BBC, I then moved to TVAM, and that um, was a unique operation um, in the sense that it had its own news operation. It was doing a breakfast programme, obviously, but it made us, um, we, we had to have an international news operation, and we had over 200 um, news staff. And it made us um, very small, but very important in the news gathering operation. BBC hated us, ITN hated us. We had to find ways of doing things which were different. And a key point in that, which is another thing I think which says a lot about the media establishment, was that we had a dispute in which we sacked all our technicians. Um, I don't know if you remember that, but um, we, we, we inherited, when TVM was founded in 1983, working practices which sometimes led to technicians getting over £100,000 
for routine work and we vowed to sort that out with the benefits of uh, with the backing of uh, a lot of senior politicians when when we did that and when we fired them um, the the news the the broadcast establishment were out to get us they wanted to get rid of our license they hated the fact that we'd taken on the unions in the way that we did and what 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 we realized was that there was a within the broadcasting establishment there was this continual pressure from the left to to do things which were broadly what the left wanted um, Spooling forward to 1999, after TVM had finished, I, I moved on to um, working f on my own. TVM lost its licence for various reasons, and we, uh, I, I became a consultant for Reuters Television, Channel 9, Australia. Um, I, I became for a while chief executive of something called the African Public Broadcasting Foundation and I also founded something called News World which was the world's first conference for news broadcasters. That gave me a, a good oversight about how, not only how news worked in the UK but on an international basis. Um, and in 1999 I happened to meet Lord Pearson of Rannoch I don't know whether any of you know of Lord Pearson, who was the leader of UKIP. And he said, he said to me in a conversation, he said, um, I'm rather desperate. We know that the BBC is so biased. I, I know your background. Can you help us and um, perhaps put the spotlight on in a way that it's never been done before? What is going on at the BBC? Why they're so biased? What, what it is about their operation that leads to them being so negative about the prospect of leaving the EU. And because of the TVM dispute, I had um, the, the IBA, as I say, threatened to take our license away. One of the ways we defended that was that I started for the first time doing a proper review of what we did each day on the news and current affairs front. And I mean, that sound, might sound rather basic, know what you're doing, but a, an awful lot of, new, lot of news broadcasters, broadcasters don't know what they're doing. They don't have an overview. They don't track on a daily basis what's going out. And I think a lot of problems stem from that. Anyway, I'd done that. So I said to Lord Pearson that what, what we would do is a full monitoring of all the media in the UK and we would transcribe everything on, on that we heard and this is very important, we're not just doing this impressionistically, we're going right back to bread and butter. Before we wrote a word of analysis we would transcribe everything and then we would come up with a report within eight weeks of the election result for the 1999 European um, elections. And the reason we choose, chose that was obviously a focus period when the BBC would have to, and other broadcasters would have to be biased, would have to be not biased uh, according to the Broadcasting Act and, um, and also where we could observe how they were covering in detail the key issues. So in that, um, ele in, in, in that uh, election we, we, we pr produced a report and its findings are rather familiar, well, they look rather familiar now. Some of the key findings were no Labour Eurosceptics were interviewed at all. Conservative splits was the key theme, and I'm reading from, from the summary that I wrote at the time, with the pro-Euro Conservative Party, which went on to win 1.2% of the votes and no seats, given similar prominence to the Conservative Party itself and the Eurosceptics within the Conservative Party. Minority parties virtually ignored with the UK Independence Party, which went on to win 7% of the votes and three seats back then, afforded only one negative interview. No discussion about the wider issues of the UK's relationship with the EU and thus about the reasons for the for Euroscepticism in Britain. 
only 2% of the news coverage on TV devoted to the elections, so bias by omission. And that, in a snapshot, is basically what we've had from the BBC over all, all the years. The BBC's response back then was, oh, we are impartial, we know. <laughs> we know. Next kind of reaction, find the lady. Oh, well, you might, have, you might have monitored all that, but you missed this at 11.30 at night on an obscure programme you've never heard of, like all the parliamentary channel. Both sides are complaining. We must be balanced. Try a complaint, but only on our terms. And that would mean that the BBC will only consider complaints if they're filed within 30 days of broadcast, 30 working days of broadcast, and they can only about what be about one or two items. We had a report based on hours and hours of output, and they were saying, oh, well, we can only consider it if you reduce it to just one complaint filed within 30 days. Mm. Next observation, you're obsessed with numbers. You can't me measure bias on, uh, by, me by counting the number of speakers. But yet, if only one interview featured the UK Independence Party, that is a number that counts. It's not that bias is about numbers, but as in any observation in the real world, if you, you, you need to look at certain measurements to understand what's going on. And finally, of course, you yourself are biased, so what you're saying is rubbish. <laughs> so that was the response. And that basically has been the hallmark of what the BBC has said all, all the way along. Just moving along and trying to bring it right up to the present day, um, there, there have been certain landmarks gone on since then. We've been pressuring the BBC over all these years. We've had bro broadly the same response, and broadly they, they haven't changed a great deal, although we think the pressure that we have brought to bear through various people, our supporters are Lord Wills, um, Lord Peer include Lord Pearson, um, Kate Hoey, Kelvin Hopkins, Labour uh, uh, MPs who are firm withdrawalists, and people like Philip Davis, Philip Hollibone, uh, and David Davis until he was elevated to the cabinet. So we've been pushing these points ever since, and the fact that we've been there as we think has been an irritant. But I'll just fill you in with some of the things that have happened. Um, a landmark was the Wilson Report of 2005, and this was um, a, a rare event, in, and, and I think probably unique, in that it's the only indep genuinely independent survey of the BBC's own output that the BBC itself has commissioned. We've been doing it from the outside, but this was actually commissioned by the uh, BBC, and that was an aberration in itself, because I don't even really remember after the um, problems with, over their Iraq coverage, there was an interregnum at the BBC. There were one chairman was fired and Greg Dyke, the DG, went. And Lord Ryder of Wensum was briefly acting chairman. And it was he who committed, commissioned the Wilson Report. And he set it up in such a way that it was genuinely independent. As I say, there were two firm inners, two firm outers, and a chairman Lord Wilson of Dinton, who I still don't know what he thinks, but he was a typical Sir Humphrey and I think genuinely balanced in how he viewed the task. What it found was that there was this point I made earlier on, huge bias by omission, not covering the important things about the EU that would genuinely inform the electorate, a mindset bias that Europe is terribly important, it's something that we cover only from a certain perspective. And the, the other point, a very poor understanding of the EU on behalf of uh, BBC journalists. BBC response back then was to appoint a Europe editor. They said they would do more EU coverage. Uh, they set up uh, education via the College of Journalism. And they said they would do a wider analysis of EU affairs. Um, they made some four specific promises, 
We offer our audiences across all platforms clear, accurate and accessible information about the way EU institutions work and their impact on UK laws of life. To ensure impartiality by reflecting the widest possible range of voices and viewpoints about EU issues, to test those viewpoints using evidence-based arguments or informed opinion, <coughs> to demonstrate the relationships between the different member states and the European Union, to reveal and explain to our, to our audiences areas of contentions, contentious fact and disputed principle. They've never done any of that. They absolutely have not. Mm. And we did a, what we've done over the years is mainly survey the Today programme and we've in fact surveyed half the editions of Today between 2005 and 2016 and it's one of the biggest databases of BBC programmes anyway. But our report in 2007, so two years on from this, where we surveyed 14 weeks of coverage in the lead up to the summit, the so-called summit, European summit of that winter. Only 2.9% of today's feature airtime was devoted to EU-related coverage, the lowest ever recorded. So this was after they vowed to increase. Europhile contributors outweighed Eurosceptics and those against EU actions by more than two to one, 41 to 20. Individual pro-EU speakers were given more space to present their arguments than the Eurosceptic and neutral speakers in terms of the number of words spoken. So not only were there more speakers, but those speakers had more time. And the ratio then added up to three to one in favor of pro-EU speakers. Um, and what we said was nothing covered in this survey supports claims made in, in the press during October by Mark Thompson, the BBC's Director General, that the corporation was exploring the views of UKIP and other shades of Eurosceptic opinion more regularly and thoroughly. Only four pro-withdrawal speakers appeared on the programme and only one of these contributions focused on calls for substantial change within the EU. The number was proportionally less than in surveys conducted before the Wilson report. Spooling forward, we had various battles. I'm, I, I, the, the, there's, there's lots I could detail, but there isn't time. The next big juncture was the Preble report in 2013, which was the BBC themselves reviewing how they've done on the, the EU since the Wilson report. Now, they appointed the panel here, and they appointed Stuart Preble, who was a friend, well, a colleague of David Lidemont, the BBC trustee who had appointed him. They'd worked together for uh, Granada for 20 years, and that, they said, was an independent uh, chairman of a panel. Um, the Preble report's findings were, it again gave the BBC a clean bill of health, it dismissed Newswatch monitoring as arithmetic, the old one. The verdict was based on, a, but their verdict was based, based on a flawed survey and opinions of BBC staff taken above the objective material that we'd provided. Preble himself was closely linked to the BBC, as I said. We wrote a huge paper um, in response for Civitas which took apart almost every element of, of the Preble report, the, method, the methodology, um, the way Preble was linked to the BBC, and so on. Um, it, it really was um, quite extra, I mean, words fail me really. It was quite extraordinary how poor a report this was. And this is the BBC, the way they defend their own coverage. Now since then, and what I'm going to try to do is bring us up to where we are now and look at whether or not there's any hope in this picture, because I'm very well aware that what I've painted is rather a gloomy picture, which as I say, you need no confirmation of. But I think there is hope in the uh, equation, and I'll just try and explain what that is. The European uh, Scrutiny Committee, which I'm sure you're aware, chaired by Sir William Cash, Bill Cash, um, decided in 2012, at the time of the Preble report, um, to, to mount their own hearings about how the BBC was doing 
in terms of delivery of information to the electorate about the EU. And um, we get Newswatch gave evidence in March 2013. Um, the BBC initially sent along um, some of their senior news executives, but not the most senior executives, and they gave evidence. And Bill Cash was not, after that, Bill Cash and the committee were not content that they'd got enough information. So they wanted the chairman to, to attend, the BBC chairman, who was then Chris Patton, of course, <laughs> needs no introduction. And, and Chris Patton actually refused um, and then was ill and resigned. Um, but Bill was on the verge of taking the most extreme action Parliament could take to get the new chairman, Rona Fair, to, uh, uh, to attend, when actually she did. And the upshot was she came, Tony Hall, who by then, of course, was Director General, came, and um, th they had hearings coming up to the 2015 general election, which was much too close for Bill Cash's liking because it meant they had to compress things. But nonetheless, they'd heard enough to, to do a report which is still there on the European Scrutiny website. Um, and, and it was a very, very scathing report which said basically the BBC was not fulfilling its charter in relation to its EU coverage. It demanded the BBC adhere to its mission and its public purposes. One of the problems of the BBC is that we all know about the charter, but the provisions to do with uh, impartiality are very vague. There are only two substantive mentions in the charter document to impartiality, and nowhere is it defined. It's left entirely to the BBC to decide what is impartiality. And that it's done through the trust, before the, the governors, then the trustees. And they've done it very, very unsatisfactorily on, on the lines that I've been explaining all along. So that's what Bill attacked in the report. He, he attacked the reluctance to appear before the committee, the lack of uh, openness. We remain profoundly unconvinced, he said, that BBC, that the BBC, in the Wilson report, that, that the aims have been fulfilled. We are not yet convinced that the BBC is training adequately equipped BBC staff to devise the questions and coverage to reflect the sides, to reflect all sides of the EU equation in accordance with the BBC Charter and its obligation. And he said then, in summary, we still remain deeply concerned about the manner in which the BBC treats EU issues. Our witnesses seem to be more intent on defending and asserting their own opinions and mindset and interpretation of the obligations under the Charter and Framework Agreement than in whether they had in fact discharged them or whether they had the mindset to carry out through the post-Wilson aims. And that was, I think, one of the most damning detailed indictments of the BBC's impartiality that there's ever been. Um, and what it pointed to, basically, is the BBC is its own judge and jury it does not listen to complaints. It defends its position, come what may. It is entirely resistant to change. And it has no idea, this came out in the hearings, what its own output is. And that's going back to my original point about TVM. Um, that crashed with the general election. And then that, in turn, crashed with the European re referendum. But between the election and the referendum, Bill managed to do another hearing, another two hearings, the chairman and Tony Hall and his chief news people. And what, what they revealed at those sessions was quite important, which was that in the referendum, they um, would adopt guidelines. And it's a complicated story. There are election guidelines, but the referendum guidelines so, so I'm going too fast. General election guidelines have been set in concrete about impartiality, have been set in concrete for years. Because referendums are relatively new, the law surrounding them is vague. There have been various um, retakes and reformings as each referendum is unfolded. So the, the, the rules about broadcasters, public service broadcasters, and 
coverage at elections are not precise. But what the BBC came up with, I think because of the pressure from the European Scrutiny Committee, were clear guidelines. Now, it's interesting, I don't know what your take was on the coverage in the referendum. Uh, we, our website, which um, I, I, I'll, I'll leave so that you can, you, can, you can look at later, we found that although there was a huge shock in the, in the BBC's referendum coverage, in that for the first time you were actually hearing people who supported withdrawal, for the first time, and that, that is um, the, one of the long-term conclusions of the Newswatch uh, analysis that people talking about withdrawal who supported withdrawal were very, very rare. Suddenly they were on, but it was done with begrudging and, and we analysed, there's loads of examples on the website, we analysed very closely what the record of, of lots of individual programmes were and when you look at it, when you took it apart, and that's always the case with this analysis, when you start taking it apart, what seemed on the surface to be some improvement most certainly was not. And moving right now forward to where we are now, once the result was hap had happened, those referendum guidelines went and what we've had since then is, I don't know what, I don't know, I, I, I'd be interested in your observations, but it's, I, I, I've written just one word, Armageddon. <laughs> That's what the BBC thinks has happened as a result of Brexit. They are looking for every opportunity possible to knock it. Yeah. That is their agenda. There is no doubt about that. And on, on our website, um, an example of this, I'm not just saying that on the basis again of impressionistic, it's impressionist, impressionism. Um, uh, we looked at what they call the Brexit collection. I don't know if any of you have seen the Brexit collection. It's on the BBC iPlayer. It's the focus of the Radio 4 iPlayer. And it's a selection of programmes that they say is representative of their output since the um, since the uh, June 23rd vote. Um, our report on that found that uh, uh, there are about, um, 20, 20, off the top of my head, I think it's about 28 programmes on there when we did the analysis. Um, we classed about 10 of those as give them the benefit of the doubt, even though there were issues in them. But at least 10 of the programmes were so seriously biased that it was quite extraordinary. The contributors were predicting rioting on the streets, the collapse of the Scots whisky, whisky industry, uh, prices rising out of control beyond anything we've seen ever before in British history. You name it, it was there. Um, in the arts world, we were going to see that the complete drying up of artistic talent because everybody was going to move to Berlin where it was free. It, 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 just fantastical, um, and yet these were the core of what what uh, the, the, this is what the BBC itself had put up as um, its uh, prime post Brexit um, reporting. The final part of my uh, study is this: I think that the British people voted for out despite what the BBC has been saying for years and years and years. So the influence of the BBC is not in some senses that great. People saw through the claims. People do, don't believe what the BBC says. I think that is fairly clear. But having said that, they do still have a stranglehold on media. Where, where we are now is that the Charter is very new BBC Charter, which is due to come into effect at the beginning of 2016, is, um, there was a debate in it in Parliament last week, um, it's more or less the I's at the stage where the I's are being dotted, the T's are being crossed, and it will very soon become law. What I do know, and I say this um, very carefully, there are things going on behind the scenes, 
um, we're, where we're trying for the first time to get incorporated into the Charter and into the uh, public purposes, which are the, how the Charter is put into effect. Uh, we're trying to get incorporated a mechanism whereby there is genuinely independent monitoring of the BBC as a fabric of what the BBC does, an inspectorate of BBC without it becoming a, a I'm not, we're not envisaging a huge Ofsted type operation, but a, a lean and mean operation within the BBC that has real power and can, is genuinely independent and can on a regular basis review what the BBC output is so that there is pressure from the inside to change content that is biased. It's maybe an optimistic, the, the, re, the, reality, the reality may be that the fact is the BBC is a public organisation of, it's hard to estimate the total number, I mean, it's 24,000 on the payroll, but there's another 50,000 pounds, 50,000 people within its orbit in terms of different elements of production. It may be that the BBC is beyond saving or beyond changing. I certainly believe increasingly that the only way of dealing with the BBC, and the IAEA, the Institute of Economic Affairs, came out with a very good paper on this in March, the only way of doing this is to privatise the BBC, to force them to accept subscription, thereby opening it up to market forces, and thereby um, making them more in touch with the real world. The problem is at the moment, it's run by a broadcasting establishment elite. It is in its own bubble. It believes what it's doing is right. I've talked about the EU today. I could talk just as much about their coverage of climate change, of immigration. I've done reports for Migration Watch, which showed conclusively that when they talked, that when they raised issues of immigration, anybody who was opposed to limits was classed as racist. Yeah. Um, asylum was confused routinely and deliberately with immigration, and so on and so forth. Wherever you look at the BBC, there are immense problems. And uh, the idea of it being a ship that can change round, I don't know. I really don't know what the answer is. Um, you may have ideas on that. But I think at that point I've run out of speed.